welcome to the EMS Nation podcast. This is such an exciting episode. We have assembled an all-star cast from the Smack Force. We're doing a live podcast from Smack Dublin. We are going to go around the room and introduce these cast of characters. Kieran, you're up. Hi there, I'm Kieran Henry. I'm an advanced paramedic with the National Ambulance Service in Ireland and also one of the creators of EMS Gathering and delighted that everybody's wow. here Amazing. visiting our country. In Hi, I'm Claire Richmond. I'm an emergency physician and I work at Sydney Hems. Uh, hi, I'm David. Uh, I'm an emergency physician here in Dublin as well and uh, I've had the privilege to work with John Hines as part of the MCI medical team. Hi, I'm Pierre Brednos. I'm Scandinavian anaesthetist from Norway doing in-hospital work and pre-hospital and retrieval work and very happy to be in Dublin. I'm James Tooley. I'm a pre-hospital consultant with the Great Western Air Ambulance and also a retrievalist on neonatal and paediatric uh, retrievals. I'm Mike Abernathy. I'm an emergency physician and flight physician with the University of Wisconsin. I'm Ashley Liebig. I'm a flight nurse and helicopter rescue specialist um, and also on the organizing committee for SMAC and SMAC Force. Hi, I'm Jason. I'm, I'm a farmer from West Cork. <laughs> <laughs> and you specialize in the home. Uh, well, IT anyway. <laughs> Absolutely. I'm Mark Forrest. Uh, I'm an anaesthetist intensivist from Cheshire in the UK. And I'm a medical director for a number of fire rescue and these firearms teams. Thank you so much, team. This is a very special conference for us because there's a member of the resuscitationist community who unfortunately met his end far earlier than anybody could have expected, but nevertheless lived life to the fullest every single day and really made patient care his number one focus in life. And as we gather in Smack Dublin, um, we are thoughtful about the contributions we have as well as the contributions Dr. John Hines had, Hines had to the entire resuscitationist community. Mike. Did you want to say something? Yeah, I mean, it was a great uh, get-together this morning. It opened up with the John Hines plenary. Uh, there were several lectures, but uh, I'd say the, the most important part of it was the address by his partner, Janet, and uh, his mother, Josephine, was also present. And when I looked at this is, you know, this was our memorial for John. It's been almost a year since he passed away, and when he did, I mean, we were all scattered to the four corners of the earth. And so this is the first time we can all be together. And I, I think it's a sense of closure uh, and sort of our salute to this really magnificent person. Ashley, you made an, a lovely comment, I thought. Uh, Smack Force is a pre-conference at the Smack uh, Dublin. And you and Dr. Claire made the lovely comment, I think, that our baby has grown up. How did Smack Force as a pre-hospital, pre-conference get started? What are the origins? And really, how have the goals grown throughout the years? Um, so Smack Force started uh, its first year last year in Chicago. Uh, the thing about it is that it was a, it was a more traditional uh, conference last year. We had, um, I mean, we, we had exceptional speakers and uh, great topics. But we just didn't have the support um, from the local community that we had here. And so <clears throat> last year we had the Australians having to lug their kit, uh, you know, across the or across the world. And and so it, it, this year has changed dramatically because we were able to move into a venue that was fantastic. Uh, we were able to convince them that we needed to be um, videoed the entire time rather than just audio for the talks. Uh, and, and really just the caliber of people that have participated and helped and having the support from the attack team, from, um, from Dave's uh, group, it has just, it, it just took it to a whole nother level. And uh, Jason Vanderbilt is our stage manager. I mean, who could have guessed, right? He should be producing Broadway shows. So it was, it was, it was absolutely more than I ever could have imagined. And so it felt like Carol and I last year sort of led that charge and uh, it felt we were so proud of what it had become. I think the production was incredible. It's almost as well sculpted as Dr. Vanderbilt's beard. That's called an alley-oop right there. <laughs> um, no, it was incredibly well done. Um, 
And simulation has been a forefront or integral component of SMAC4 since its inception last year. And I remember Dr. Claire, uh, the Sydney Hems uh, simulations that you did last year in Chicago were just phenomenal and really uh, demonstrated the ideal way that you have a team-centered approach to your critical care recess in the pre-hospital or limited resource environment. Um, this year at the EMS gathering, we had the pleasure of uh, meeting uh, Dr. Vanderbilt as well as Dr. Forrest at the Farmageddon. Can you tell us a little bit about uh, ATTACK as well as um, the history of the course and the future, what you guys envision, and there was phenomenal simulation that was done at this SMAC force, so much so that people needed to be consented beforehand and <laughs> psychological uh, intervention was available should folks need it. So we would love to hear all about that. Well, attack evolved from uh, frustrations with ATLS in the UK good 16 years ago now, many of us were ATLS instructors and it wasn't moving quickly. Enough. Are, are folks, the are folks frustrated with ATLS? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 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 I think, you know, at least 10. I think, you know, anyway. So, we, we started off ourselves and initially it didn't look that much different, I guess, but uh, from there on in it started to evolve more and more and, and very early on simulation and making it as real as possible, whether it be a demonstration, whether it be a practical, whether it be a scenario, was a huge part of it. And as you see, that's 16 years of development to where we are now. Um, tremendous support from Jason as well and the rest of the team. James, that we all put a lot of time into preparing beforehand. I think it's the same. It's that preparation is everything. Yeah. I mean, it's everything in terms of you're going to run a conference. It's and then we just seem like that. We, we yeah. set our objectives and then we, we, use a, we use an acronym CASPER to develop it. And that's the CASIM, the actors, basically the scenario, any props, simulators we need, the environment, and then how we review it and risk assess it. And that's Casper. Would you mind walking us through the scenario, the preparation, and uh, the interventions that were done, some of the patients? I think the active shooter is so relevant in current society, uh, regardless of where you live on this lovely planet Earth. Um, and I think it was incredibly well received and appreciated by the audience. So we'd love for you to walk through the scenario and uh, tell us how you brought your vision to life. Well, I think, uh, Mark, it's fair to say there that um, from conception, this was a good six, six months in planning. I mean, it, and um, right from the start, I mean, Claire, you were, you were quite involved in uh, just trying to make sure that, uh, yeah, we took simulation to as, as far as we can go, but also we didn't want to psychologically bruise anybody. Um, so from the start, the team kind of came together and uh, we said, look, how far, how far do we want to go? Um, and I think, uh, Mark, you, you kind of pushed it, a, pushed it a lot. I mean, you were far more involved in... Yeah, well, I mean, it, it, putting the script together was probably the, the easier bit. As you say, the harder bit was then exactly what you say, how far you went. And a lot of the Skype calls, we were concerned about, you know, people's welfare. As delivering the message, that wasn't going to be so difficult because we often do that. And we just needed to make it bigger. Uh, but it was the welfare issues, and, and we all sort of discussed that, didn't we? We had a, quite a few disagreements at the start, didn't we, Claire, just in terms of what we were going to do and what we were going to say. Yeah, we had some discussions around how far do we push it, and I think that was something that was really important for us, to know how far do we push it in terms of um, the scene and what we were setting up for people, because the, this was a different scenario in many ways because the audience were part of the simulation in that they were being held hostage by our terrorist gunmen, um, and we were concerned about that because we do, ha do understand that people in SMAC Force have been exposed to this in their day-to-day -day life, in their working life, and that's something that we wanted to make sure that no one had any issues that we weren't able to help them through if that was to arise during the simulation. Um, so we had lots of discussions around that and debate about whether to pre-brief people beforehand and tell them that there was an active shooter sim or whether to keep it on the down low and we elected to keep it on the down low but actually provide that psychological safety pre-brief that was sent out um, and actually make sure that people are aware that there was going to be things that were confronting because during Smack Force not only was this confronting but also the simulation that um, Dave performed later in the day was confronting and some of the other things, topics that were brought up had potential to actually affect people and that it's really important to be aware of that. I think for the podcast people have got to realise uh, we actually used um, Angara Shikona uh, 
tactical unit, which is the armed police here in Ireland, and we were using real stun grenades and we were using real firearms with, with blanks. Um, so the audience was actually smelling the cordite and uh, seeing the kind of fire from the, from the barrels with the lights down. Um, to say it was confronting, I think. I want, we, we all actually underestimated it at the start, just how, how loud it was going to be in that theatre. Um, we actually had pre brief people and worked into a script, which cleared it actually brilliantly, just worked the script between them. Uh, we, we had a fake uh, speaker at the conference, mm -hmm. who's, you know, trying to set the scene, and everybody was blinded to this. It was really good backstage, and I was sitting there, you know, producing, and I had the, you know, the tension amongst all of the, uh, the IT people, and the guys were all protecting their sound equipment, and, you know, having, having had a practice of letting a stun grenade off the, the day before. That was quite a shock. It, 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 to, say, to say it quite the least, we're looking around for dead pigeons, you know, in the it. theater. <laughs> But I, I would say the multi-sensory, you know, you're, it's not just visual, you're not just sitting back watching something and said, you hear it, you feel it, you smell it. I mean, that's the immersion. As I said, I'm watching this, I, okay, I know this is him, I know this is him, but there's something in my subconscious telling me to get the hell out of here. Come on, let's go, get there. Yeah. I mean, absolutely, I think that's the attack. Uh, ethos that's there, the Martin, uh, you, you, yeah. you want to fully immerse yourself. I mean, Perry, you, you start to do a lot of you know, immersive, immersive sim down your way as well. And I think it was really great being not the one uh, organizing, creating, making the simulation, but actually be sitting as an ordinary part of the audience and just having the same amount of information and just expecting, okay, what is this? And I'm was expecting this is going to touch me somehow because we've had really unpleasant shootings in Norway and that can happen in any other country and it does happen, unfortunately. So I think anyone in the room had the same sensation of, I can, I can withdraw myself from this because this is actually my day-to-day -day life, potentially, uh, either as an EMS professional or just by accident being in the wrong theatre at the wrong time. So I think everybody had that sensation of, ooh, this is, uh, this is relevant, this is unpleasant, but it's really, really useful to um, have these emotions, have that sensation, feel your sympathetic nervous system kicking off and just work with all that. I think it was fantastic just sitting, being part of it as in the audience. Yeah, because we often teach how to deal with autonomic, or, autonomic overload and uh, how to slow your heart rate down. Uh, yeah, I knew that simulation was going to happen. And I have to say, I had all the autonomic uh, <laughs> uh, side effects. See, my heart rate was 150 and their uh, hands are sweating and, uh, wow. and I was terrified. Okay. Um, so I think it's really important for us to be able to find our level and, and move on from that. Um, and I hope that's what the audience were able to, to take away. I also think um, from an organizing committee standpoint or from just a committee standpoint and someone who has a military background and, and so it, that's near and dear uh, to me, um, I feel like I'm really proud of we all sort of we disagreed on various levels in planning, but I'm really proud of how everyone came together and created this plan and uh, really, really thought it out and negotiated and and uh, that people would be safe and that there was an, there was an option for them to provide for their psychological safety and, and well-being. And so I'm really proud of the of this group and how we how we came together and also that it's something that is recognized. So we recognize that this could be confronting, that this could be an issue, and we prepared for that. So that, that to me, says we are already moving le leaps and bounds in, this, in the field of, of uh, psychological safety and taking care of one another and training. So I think that's great. I, I think that's really important, and that was just a key part of the lesson for us. Obviously, there was all the other elements, and I think what we were aiming to do there was show on the type of injuries and how, how graphic they'll be and how traumatic to see, never mind manage. And then what the capabilities of the modern police force, the firearms teams are, because they, they were demonstrating some really quite you know, uh, challenging and advanced trauma skills all the way through from hemorrhage control right the way through to surgical airway on stage with their medical support. Um, and, and I think, again, we, we achieved that, demonstrated it quite effectively. The guys did so well, um, because they were you know, doing it for real. They were in the zone. Uh, and th one thing that was very interesting, because we've been running s fairly similar simulations with the SWAT team in Norway, but just with the team and the medical partner not having the audience. And having the audience and being in the theatre just brought it to a very different level, because then it was, oh, I could have been sitting here, this could happen. And I caught myself in, and I feel around me thinking, 
where is that exit? Where would I hide? Where, what would I do now if this was for real? So I think that from actually doing scenarios very similar and then having the audience, for me, brought it very close to reality. That's fantastic. Um, for the audience listening at home, I'm sure they're regretting not coming to Smack Forest and they will never make that mistake again. Um, Mark, would you mind digging into the casualties, the medical care, as well as the capabilities of that tactical team? And also, if we could transition, um, how do you guys in your own municipalities uh, plan on creating these sorts of immersion type activities, you know, whether it's the integration of fire police, because this is reality in 2016, this is what we're dealing with. How do you bring this knowledge home with you? I think um, the UK police, like, like many other around the world now, they recognize the need to upscale they, from the traditional sort of first aid at work, and, and now they have a very focused training plan, D13 and D13 enhanced. And part of that is it has to be real. It has to include immersive simulation and tactical simulation. Um, and then the skills are exactly what we would expect. A primary focus on massive hemorrhage control, airway management, and you know, chest trauma, ballistic chest trauma. Um, they learn other skills as well, but that's the core of it. And that's what we aimed to, to demonstrate yesterday. So just to run through the casualties, we had one with um, a, a through through wound in the arm with massive hemorrhage. We had another one uh, with a neck wound with a carotid bleed. Um, it was bleeding out very quickly, needed very rapid intervention. And then the speaker that we described earlier, um, he had major trauma from the bus of a rifle to the face and a through and through chest wound. Um, yeah, I suppose uh, it's the same with anything to do. It's coming back down to preparation and um, you know, absolute attention to detail. And we always use professional actors. That's something we've, we've taken an awful long time to come around to. Mm -hmm. And I'm sure like many of you have used, mm -hmm. you know, you know, you, oh, you, you're, you're part of the course. Come on in, come on in. Could you just lie down here and do it? Right, and, and have progressed, uh, you know, to using, okay, right, we're going to get a volunteer for the day. Or, or even in Sydney, you use your own um, instructors and, and, and to, to ensure that it's, it's real. And I suppose we, we've used that for real simulation. And... Uh, you know, we've all grown up together for almost the last 10 years, and uh, so that's a relationship we've had. And effectively, if you're going to run a course, do a conference, do something, do a demo, whatever you're doing, or like at the EMS gathering, we ran Farmageddon. If you want somebody to go through eight scenarios over two days, and you've got to have the same standard for the first group that goes through to the last group that ends. And the only way to do that is, is generally have somebody professional doing it. Um, and I think that was the that was the icing on the cake. I think for for me the professionalism of that team that that helped us. And then also the the professional was actually part of that group, which is that guy um, who who are actually doing it. Um, and equally with David's uh, simulation. Yeah, this is my first exposure to Sims with professional victim, and it started at the EMS gathering on the farm. Uh, that's when as I walked into that, I was just wowed and. Um, yeah, that, that made a huge difference. And again, their consistency, because you're doing it over and over and over, and these people are professionals. And they've obviously researched, you know, the head injured patient. He was good, you know. And the girl who caught her arm up in the, the bailing equipment, again, uh, their response to the various interventions, you know, they know if you get, you get two milligrams of morphine, ah, nothing much happens. Or if you get ketamine, this happens. And um, yeah, it really just took things to a, a different plane. I think one, one of the key things here is actually to acknowledge that we need to do simulations like this. We cannot do a single vehicle, single motor vehicle, or the push it, maybe maybe the, the child on the bike, and that's been as far as we've been pushing it. Well, we do a lot of that, that's all fine, but we actually need to acknowledge this is the type of simulation crossing borders, interprofessional skills, getting to know each other. That's where we need to be at the moment with the current threat from the world. I think it's important to be able to adapt your simulation to um, the level of crew that you're dealing with. I mean, certainly if I went back um, several years, just the screaming of the casualty would have been enough to, uh, to turn me into overload. Yeah. Or the sight of the blood spurting out of the neck. And of course I can deal with the screaming, deal with the blood, deal with bones poking out. Um, yesterday was a new thing for me by having a gun pointed at me. So I think um, yeah, it's about what your level of your team are and, uh, and finding someone's level 
where you've pushed them to that limit. And that's true sort of stress inoculation. So that, for us, as a bunch of senior clinicians, uh, we found that very stressful. Yeah, Kieran, I mean, you brought that other element into the EMS gathering to, to Farmageddon. We were actually putting the farmers along with you, didn't you? Yeah, absolutely. Well, you know, so we ran EMS gathering um, this year, so we run it for the last few years, but we couldn't resist this year, the fact that there were so many people coming from all over the world uh, to SMAC, and we've collaborated with SMAC and SMAC Force and the people who've come here, and it's, and it's been fantastic to see people come from Sydney, Hems, and the United States, and, and all over. So um, we run a lot of outdoor workshops, and we bring people up the mountains, and we have, you know, people out on bicycles learning about childbirth and various other uh, point-of-care ultrasound workshops. But this year, we decided to run um, a farm injuries response workshop, because we felt that, you know, there, were, there are a lot of farm injuries happening out there, and... Again, just exactly what people have said here, the best way to learn about how you deal with an animal goring somebody is inside in a shed with an animal there, with the smells, down in, in the dirt, and hearing the noises and the whole lot. And just like as well with the, the slurry tank and the falls and stuff like that. So again, the attack, uh, people came on board to do the simulation, and we had fantastic educators coming on board. And I have to thank the Horn family, family farm, who gave up. And it's a very busy time for farming in Ireland. They gave up their farm for a number of days uh, to, to facilitate us. But we also brought farmers uh, to the uh, to, to the two-day workshop just to just to work with them and, and, and again to, to to see what their senses of how they deal with farm injuries. And, and there was lots of education going on there. And um, Again, the feedback that we've, we've had has been incredible. And the good news is that a lot of it is recorded and we will be able to put, out the, put it out there in the future. But again, the, the, the simulation really, you know, everybody is just talking about uh, how good it was. And, uh, you know, we worked again with the, um, just lots of agencies came on board, the National Ambulance Service, the local fire service, the Irish Air Corps uh, came in with, a, with an aircraft. And uh, it was really good and, and really positive and just people are looking for more of it. So... You know. Thanks for sharing that, Karen. I think it's relevant that we also share with you, uh, since the last podcast uh, wrap-up of the EMS gathering, we've had so much feedback to say, hey, let the organizers know we want an EMS gathering 2017. <laughs> 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 okay. Twice a year. Come on. Well, yeah, <laughs> we're just, uh, we've gone from EMS gathering so to straight to SMAC 4, straight to SMAC. So uh, we'll reflect on things over the next uh, over the next few days and all that. But um, uh, watch this space. But, uh, you know, if the demand is there and there, there are people who, who want it, you know, we, we might be able to to put something out there. Absolutely great resuscitation training. Um, Mark and Jay, for folks in the U.S., there's certainly a lot of frustration with ATLS. In fact, we'll say all, all over the universe. Uh, but we are not that familiar with the attack course. Um, we're certainly going to include uh, the links to the websites in the show notes. I think folks would be very interested in learning more about the course. But um, how can people enroll, get involved? And would you also mind just detailing the BTAC course? Okay, um, ATTAC was the first course, uh, and as I say, it's the advanced level we did. Uh, ATTAC is run not for profit, all the money is reinvested back into the course. And stands for anesthesia, and trauma, and critical care. That's correct, mm -hmm. yeah. So originally it had a significant anesthetic focus, but now it's just generally spread into trauma and critical care, very much like SMAC. Um, and it's short, punchy lectures, very much TED style yeah, in the way we present, present, which is quite a shock to a lot of people because they're used to the death by PowerPoint and the usual. Um, and then lots and lots of immersive sim, hands on practice, where anything we can get them to do, we let them do. Plus, the fact with some, some demonstrations, very much like Dave and the guys did yesterday, you know, high quality sims with checklists and key messages. Um, the course has, has evolved, and there's lots of demand from other agencies like police firearms and fire and rescue and others. And that's where BTAC group, which is basic drama and casualty care, um, and that's a watered down version of ATTAC. And then there is a middle level ATTAC, so they run seamless three, mm -hmm. seamlessly right through from the introductory level right the way through the, through the advanced level. So a provider at ATTAC level can work alongside a BTAC provider, same principles, different methods. And that's, the, that's where we work. And there's even a first aid level now as well. I think the interdisciplinary component, you have a heterogeneous team, 
coming together, speaking the same language, all operating on the same algorithms is a uh, found foundation for this type of critical care resuscitation. And Dave, you are no stranger to working in a team environment, especially in Ireland is one of the retrievalists and one of, the, correct me if I'm wrong, but five physicians that does pre-hospital RSI in the country, is that correct? That's probably five, I think, yeah. Yeah, it is. Yeah. Well, it's, it's you, me, Hugh, and Cork, and uh, Jason and Aiden. Jason, yep. yeah. So yeah, so it is five. So I suppose the the, the advanced pre-hospital critical care uh, capability in Ireland is still uh, fairly limited and a little ad hoc, but I think that's going to change. Um, and I suppose what we tried to show in our simulation uh, with the MCI medical team was what can be done with um, an ultra-fast response and a, a very high volume of care dropped on a scene very quickly. So it's a little bit unique again. Uh, so what we did was uh, the demonstration of the resuscitation of an injured motorcyclist who crashed at about 120 miles an hour into a stone wall. Um, and uh, I suppose that's something that uh, unfortunately happens several times a year in our race season uh, and therefore is something that we we're quite used to dealing with. Um, the case that we did yesterday at Smack Force uh, was actually essentially a reenactment of a real case. Um, and Which was a surprise for the audience. Folks yeah, that. yeah. So I think we had, so we actually had video footage of the rider crashing and of the initial response. Um, uh, and poignantly, it was the last case we worked with John Hines. So I think there was, a, you know, a, 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 an extra little layer, uh, and that for us certainly. Um, at the end, we had the the rider Ian Morell uh, come out on stage actually to prove that it does work, and I think that certainly. Uh, gave, gave us a lot of closure on what's been a difficult year. Um, in terms of what we try to show in the sim, uh, I think there is a lot, a lot of stuff that, that we do is done everywhere. You do an RSI, you use a checklist, you've got one safe approach, you've got a low threshold for thoracostomies, uh, we don't bother with a cervical collar initially, we don't give any fluids. So it's, I won't say it's fairly standard, but it's certainly an accepted level of care, uh, I think, at, at the, the sort of cutting edge internationally. Um, but our response time was about 45 seconds. So we get to see physiology and pathology that doesn't exist in the real world. So uh, impact apnea, uh, we've certainly recorded at least nine cases uh, in the south of Ireland. I know that there's a number more in the north, which you only see in the first few minutes. Um, so that's one unique thing. And the second thing is what do you do when you've got uh, 10 practitioners at a scene and one patient? And that's potentially too many. You know, if you don't have a structure and a plan and predetermined roles and responsibilities, you fall over each other, uh, you step over the patient, lines get pulled out, tubes get dropped. So uh, we try to show how you can use those people in a structured way uh, to essentially extricate a patient, ventilate them, sedate them, cannulate them, package them safely, deliver an RSI, decompress both sides of their chest and package them for extrication in, I think it was 11 minutes, um, which, you know, is, is perhaps slightly faster than it would happen in reality, but not much. I mean, our scene times would, would routinely be under 15 minutes uh, if it's a, shall we say, a straightforward case. So I suppose that was the uh, the sort of things that we tried to show. I think for from the team's perspective, um, we actually found it quite stressful. Um, it was a lot more stressful than doing it for real. Um, not because you're being watched or because you do anything differently, but I think we wanted to be sure that it was as close to perfect as it could be, except that that's not the reality. Uh, we wanted to highlight all the things that were done well. Uh, and I think we did that. And I suppose, you know, having been lucky to work with John for so many years and not really realize that we were being taught uh, un until he was gone, uh, to actually be able to turn around and reflect that back uh, as, a, as a finished product meant a lot to us. Um, and, and, you know, this morning was, was, was kind of hard for us, I suppose, seeing the the, the, the photo montage and, and having people talk about him because I think for for those of us that were here when he died we did a lot of that a year ago uh, and that's not to say that we've we've moved on but it, it kind of started a lot of the process again but I think it's as Mike said it's a it's a it's a it's a little bit of closure now it's kind of it's 12 months time it's the first time everybody here has kind of been together since last July um, we've a bike race this weekend and then we've scaries on the first and second of July, which is the race that John crashed at. So that'll be the that'll be the tough one and then after that I think well we just have to look to the future.
I think, um, in all credit to yourselves uh, as a team, you, know, you were the team that responded to John, and that best chance. Yeah, yes, best, chance. best chance ever. There is his team, you know, and that's um, that's something extremely difficult, and we've all had a lot of difficulty dealing with that. I think his legacy will live on, and, and you know, I suppose it's just the whole thing, and I'm I have to say I'm very proud um, to sit here in Dublin in Ireland today and just to see the amount of people who are here, you know, involved in critical care, involved in pre-hospital care is that, that we are all involved in. And, um, you know, it's a very important year even here in Ireland is the year of the rising, you know. And I just want to spread the word and through all the the ways through social media and through other terms and for, for people to learn and for, for colleagues to educate and I hope you know with these podcasts and different ways and that we should you know for people who are new to that we could encourage other colleagues onto social media and onto Twitter I've certainly learned loads and continue to learn as much as I can each time you know from everybody and from colleagues and from the people who are here and, and it's about sharing knowledge and it's about inspiring each other and just learning as much as we can so that when we go out and look after the people who are, again, as I say, potentially having the worst day of their lives, that we can do our best for those. And uh, I'd just like to say thanks to SMAC and thanks to all of you people who are so encouraging and supportive and, you know, collaborative and collegiality and keep on going on. <laughs> you know, it's great. So, so you're so welcome and I hope you enjoy your stay here. Even for those who are uh, a little bit older and greyer as well, I mean, it's exactly the same. You know, seeing all the young guns coming through, we all come and we learn so much. What an incredible gathering of people. Uh, it is just an amazing event uh, at every level. So I, I totally agree. I think it was one, there was one new thing for me yesterday, or for uh, hopefully for a lot of people, that, I mean, I do a lot of time with work with simulation and, and like to see the effect of it, which is very hard to measure. And we've all been to conferences where some survivor or some ex-patient is brought onto the scene, everybody's happy, hallelujah, fantastic. But yesterday what you did, I only reflected on it uh, last night, was that actually you linked training simulation with the survivor, which was quite strong. We've done a lot of things where actual treatment has been led, linked up to a survivor, but this was actually training simulation, multiple teams, cross-professional, linked up to a survivor, which was... Uh, quite strong from seeing from an educationalist point of view. I love that. Yeah, and I think um, just reflecting back on that and, and, and what I was saying earlier, the, the, the stress levels on Sunday, which was the day before Smack Force, um, certainly in, in my head and in our team were high um, because we're conscious we wanted it to be perfect. And I think that like anybody who's doing a talk at Smack Force or at Smack, uh, they'll have it rehearsed a hundred times till it's almost word perfect. And you'll have it into me <laughs> five days <laughs> before, <laughs> not, um, and if you don't have it as a pair of those, <laughs> you speak without slides. Yep. And then you change the whole concept. <laughs> <laughs> One but minute you before. Awesome. You were awesome. But uh, the, 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 the stress levels were high because we wanted to be perfect. And I think as a result, we were picking holes in, in tiny details that even if you were doing a high fidelity sim to sign somebody off as a competent practitioner, you wouldn't pick holes in. Um, so, in effect, that that became a huge part of our pre-season training because we'll take what we did in, in, in practicing, almost acting, back to, to reality. And, and those fine details uh, of, of little things, that, that last 1%, or even maybe it's the last 0.5% now, um, sometimes can be the difference. 11 minutes will be incredible teaching footage for those out there listening to the podcast. That we, you could see all day that just on that 11 minutes. That's such a good demonstration. I think for both of the teams that actually were in the simulations was actually what I found was most fascinating is as you've described, we rehearsed it on Sunday, we rehearsed it during the day on Monday as well. But the thing that we actually came back to to both of the teams as they're about to go on was, guys, just go and do what you do. So as much as we're saying we rehearse it, this is actually they did what they do when they're at work, and that's really important to remember. So I first learned about Dr. Hines' uh, protocol for responding to traumatic arrest and the incredible outcomes associated with that. 
And that was an incredibly poignant moment you just shared, Dave, that you actually responded and Dr. Forrest, you're saying that, you know, he honestly did have the best chances possible. Um, there was uh, tremendous confusion. My medics, as I was an EMS fellow in the fire department in New York City, were coming up to me and saying, hey doc, you know, really what's our approach to traumatic arrest? Are we doing compressions? We're not really sure. Is that going to make any difference whatsoever? Um, can you run us through the protocol? Yeah, and I suppose, um, you know, it probably wasn't written down in a huge amount of detail mm -hmm. before John died. Um, but I suppose that the first thing to say is that as we'd see, a traumatic cardiac arrest isn't a single disease. It's a couple of things. Medical cardiac arrest is, well, it's, it's the four H's and the four T's if you subscribe to, to dogma. But, you know, it's, it's shockable or it's non-shockable. There's a couple of peri-arrest things that you can modify. And after that, it's fairly, um, it's fairly binary in many ways. But traumatic cardiac arrest, um, that is survivable. There's really only a couple of things you're trying to co correct. One is impact apnea, which most of us don't see. If you crash your bike or your car in civilian practice, it's going to be seven or eight minutes for a very good EMS to get a responder to you, unless you're using something like the Good Sam app in London. Uh, maybe that's that's something to come back to another time. Um, but impact apnea is something that we see enough, and we get there quickly enough by the virtue of the fact that the circuits are short uh, to fix. So you ventilate the patient, they breathe, they have a pulse, um, they become agitated, you sedate them or they, they wake up fine and it's all over. Um, I suppose the other pathology you can fix is tension pneumothorax. Uh, and it's very hard to diagnose that, particularly in an arrest, so we just presume it's there. Um, and the only way to diagnose is to decompress both sides of the chest uh, with a thoracostomy as opposed to a needle, which isn't long enough or wide enough most of the time. So we would do that as a routine. Um, you do need an airway, so uh, intubation without drugs if that can be done without interrupting the flow. Um, and then you're looking to control hemorrhage. And the only hemorrhage you can control externally really is uh, to put on a pelvic binder and to get the limbs out to length. Um, if there is obvious external bleeding, I think, you know, tourniquets and hemostatic dressings, but that's not something we, we see a huge amount of in motorsport. It tends to be blunt trauma. And if at that point you've got no return of circulation, you've got to think, well, am I going to give volume, which Currently in Ireland is going to be clear fluids, which isn't terribly helpful. Um, if you have blood, I think your threshold will be a little different. Um, or am I going to do something invasive like open the chest or do a reboa? Um, and that's really just, again, to be diagnostic of where the bleeding is uh, and potentially to control it either by identifying a bleeding point or more, more likely by compressing the aorta uh, to at least be able to resuscitate the, the, the top half of the body. So that's essentially the protocol. Many cardiac arrests have devastating injuries. They're not survivable, um, and, and that needs to be recognized. But there's, there's a small percentage that if you get there quickly uh, and you ventilate the patient, you decompress their chest, and you, and you, you provide some uh, quick, safe external hemostasis, you'll get a return of circulation. And then you obviously need to move quickly to get them to a point where you can establish the nature of their injuries and, and take it on from there. So it's actually straightforward. And we will give TXA early on. Um, I think there is a little bit of a... Uh, perhaps a, a myth about TXA that it's almost like what we would say in Ireland is holy water. Uh, it's not a miracle drug, um, but if you're going to give it, you should give it soon. So we would certainly subscribe to that going in straight away if there's a, a possibility of bleeding. Um, so bilateral finger thoracostomies. Mike, I was wondering if you can comment on this. That is not uh, commonly done in the States. We still pussyfoot around with <laughs> angiocast uh, insufficient length. Uh, and we all know the recent annual paper in 2015, which showed that you know what we commonly deploy, second act, mid axillary line, etc., is um, uh, oftentimes not decompressing our tension pneumothorax. Uh, how do we address this in the U.S.? Should we be moving towards a protocol where medics are doing finger thoracostomies as opposed to decompression with needle on, needles and things along those lines? Yeah, that's difficult. First of all, if you're going to decompress a chest uh, doing needles, you know, don't use angiocaths. You know, angiocaths aren't made for that. There are the ARS type devices, so, or you can use something like a turquoise needle. Uh, if you are going to use something, it has to be adequate length and adequate thickness so it doesn't kink. But the whole idea, if you're truly worried about tension physiology, we're not talking about an old COPD or who blows a bleb or something. We're talking about like trauma. Uh, you know, you're going to have blood and muck, and that is going to occlude your needles so very quickly. 
so I'm a firm believer, you know, in using finger thoracostomies. But even in, I find even in our trauma bays, our surgeons will have a traumatic arrest. Their first step is to needle the chest and put in chest tubes. Um, you know, instead of wasting, you know, the time associated with an intern putting in a chest tube, rather than just immediately, as I said, clearing the chest, you know, finger in each side, and then you just move on down. Uh, but, um, but yeah, we, we've met some resistance. We carry the, uh, the IRS type device, uh, but again, in traumatic arrest type situations, I do use a finger thoracostomy. Um, James, you, you, you gave a fantastic talk yesterday uh, you know, with, with the children. And what, do you, what do you think about the same topic? Yeah, so um, well, I spoke about how to prepare yourself for the challenges of looking after a sick child, and then John McCormack after me spoke about um, childhood traumatic arrests. And of course, there's applicable data. We have to just uh, there aren't any randomised studies in children's cardiac arrests. Well, we really aren't in adults either, are there? But most of the children's medicine, certainly within uh, pre-hospital critical care, it just has to be applied across boundaries. And very similar in children, if it's penetrating trauma, traumatic cardiac arrest might might work. Um, we can certainly do fit bilateral finger thoracostomies in children um, as long as you can fit your finger between their ribs and I think that's where you do en enter, enter problems. Um, uh, and yes, of course, um, one of the challenges for looking after children is usually unfamiliarity either with the equipment or actually sometimes just with parallels with your own children can cause you quite a lot of problems. Um, so yeah, I think actually simulation is pretty key in the paediatric setting to be able to know where's your knowledge gaps, what equipment you carry, what equipment can you use to deal with uh, critical care in the pre-hospital environment and, uh, and actually sometimes just know about your own coping mechanisms. Um, please. I'm saying that, it's quite, it's quite similar to the thing. This is, I think a key word is acknowledging an, an issue, something we need to deal with, like with the, we need to have the ongoing shooting because that was up in time and you can just see that more and more mannequin producers are producing neonatal, premature, pediatric uh, mannequins now, which you couldn't hardly yeah, find so. 10 years ago. They just come out with 700 grams from level, very useful as well for the premature birth or transport mm -hmm. and stuff like that. You can see that the manufacturers are seeing, well, we need to train on the ugly, unpleasant, maybe too close to our own family issue. We need to train that. But that's cool. Acknowledge is a key word, I think. I actually liked your talk yesterday, James, as well. Um, just you know, and, and it was fantastic to hear an expert like you just kind of even just talking about the using charts and apps and different things for as memory aids for you know weights, calculations, and stuff like that. You really brought it down to the level of you know simplicity in some ways, you know, as opposed to the challenging uh, nature of it. So it was. Uh, yeah, I'd certainly recommend you, um, there's a whole host of paper references from the different air ambulance uh, services. Uh, there's several electronic apps, and most of them don't catch, cost much more than, you know, uh, one pound or, you know, two US dollars. Um, so I would certainly recommend you have a look through it there, and I can certainly recommend some of those if you'd like me to link to those. Um, and the other thing I think is, um, actually when you're doing your simulations, um, just work through, you know, how can you remember any of those dates, etc. And then it actually comes down to my, rec my main recommendation for children, if you're not, if you're not trained in paediatrics, is just treat them like you're adults. Mm -hmm. You know, we, we want to accept that there are some differences. Of course, there's, of course, there's a huge difference between those 700 gram babies we're, we're talking about that layered LCM. But actually, if you just applied your adult standard of care to a 700 gram baby, you do, you would be fine. And you'd certainly do better than actually just standing there frozen, not oh, knowing what to do. One of my rats, and all of us involved in, um, in, in, in farming, um, that's pre hospital and retrieval medicine, um, you know, it's so for certain, 23% of my cases are children under the age of 16. 23% of my cases. It would be the same for you, 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 same for you. And it's getting over the fact that we don't do simulation or training 23% of the time with children. We might just add it in here or add it in, in there. And I think that we need to change it, don't we? We do, but also I think the, the issue of the app is really important because I think any course now that's demanding that you do the calculation during the course or during the test is just, that's just okay because you just wouldn't do it. it it's far more far safer and more practical. Get the app out, use the chart, whatever is out there. These aids are there. We, it's madness not to use them. Yeah. I mean, I, I, I must admit, I do actually have a paper 
page per age reference uh, manual I keep in my um, in my pocket as well, just because I have had. Well, first of all, I've dropped my phone in a puddle before, and uh, and secondly, um, you know, if you use your phone enough times during the day, it soon runs out. You know, taking all the pictures of helicopter and that sort of stuff. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So I think yeah, just being aware that your battery can sometimes fail. Um, I do actually have a, a page per age paper reference book as well, but I think it's just having something available yeah. for you as a team. I think it's great. And train with it as well as using it. Yeah, that's the key point, kids. We spend so much time building it up to be something completely different that people are terrified of treating children, and then they don't. And actually, as you said, if you do the adult stuff, well, that'll be good enough most of the time. Neonates, I think, are, are a slightly different species, but you know, once, once they pull out of that, they are, they are just smart that, adults. We yeah. all feel exactly the same about that, don't we? Yeah, yeah. yeah and, and so, so I, quite several people have said to me today, yeah, but that doesn't... That doesn't count for neonates. I said, yeah, I, I would just do exactly the same thing. You know, if they were bleeding, I'd stop them bleeding. If their airway's not open, open it up. Um, if they're not, you know, if they're not breathing, stick a bag valve mask on and puff them. Uh, and laryngeal masks go down around to two kilos now. So I would definitely recommend, you know, brand new baby, pink eye gel, stick it down there, puff it, and it will work. Uh, and you know, the good thing is, most of the uh, neonatal problems are, pro are going to be related to they're not breathing properly. So I think if you can just get around that airway. LMA down, uh, you'll you'll be uh, you'll be halfway there, three quarters away there. I would imagine that we all around the table here for the show could agree on that children are just small adults yeah. with some differences that we need to acknowledge and we need to train on them. Yeah, yeah. Amazing. Well done. I think that's a huge disparity all across the world, but certainly we see that in the states with critical care pediatrics. Uh, immediately, there's a sphincter tightening of the responder and they're going to fight flight freeze. And freezing is the most common and unfortunate uh, sort of stance you can potentially adopt in that critical situation. So you offer some amazing tips, uh, James, just to overcome that initial barrier and to start doing something. Know what you know how to do and implement that. Exactly. You know, uh, we watch this with paediatric simulations. I mean, most of us would just be hardwired when we arrive on scene at a trauma patient, for example, to just uh, crack on, sort out seat safety, take a handover, and just do a primary survey. But in the paediatric simulations, they take the handover, they check the scene safety, etc., and don't know what to do. So just get on and do your uh, standard primary survey. Um, and, and, you know, it just buys you at least 30 or 60 seconds to think, oh, wow, what am I going to do next? Share that pressure amongst your colleagues to say, I think I might be a bit frozen here. Be able to recognise any of your colleagues if they have become frozen. I think it's you know, excellent CRM. We'll see you through this. Uh, and any bit to add on uh, stress inoculation training uh, there, Dr. Claire? I think probably the most important thing in, I think, paediatrics is the one where we really do need to focus on how do you change things. So recognising it is the first step, obviously, of getting on scene, but actually stimulation and coming up with techniques for yourself or your colleagues. So tactical breathing certainly is something um, something to ground you. I know that one of my registrars one day said that the thing that grounded them was opening the bag and seeing their equipment, and it really grounded them back to that level of familiarity. And so you need to work something out that helps you to become grounded again in a job that actually seems like it otherwise would take you um, into a level of stress. Amazing. Uh, we want to be respectful of your time. Long day. We're certainly wrapping up, coming to a conclusion. There were a couple of rants uh, per Smack Force tradition, <laughs> and I was hoping that you might be able to share some words on that. Well, I got to do one again. My life is one continuous rant. <laughs> but, uh, <laughs> but yeah, so one of the things I'm passionate about is post intubation analgesia. And, uh, and it's done very badly. People, once you get the tube in, I'll just give them a little verset and all that. So it's something I'm very passionate about. And Scott Weingart did a great podcast. And, you know, the takeaway thing is it's about analgesia first and then a little sedation. And then that's the point I was trying to get. You know, it's incredibly painful. It's incredibly stressful to the body. Don't torture your patients. So. What's the cocktail that you use, sir, for post-intubation sedation? Um, in the field, I'll typically have uh, ketamine because I've always used that for my induction agent, and I'll just pop the syringe in the driver and then just give a continuous infusion of ketamine, maybe with a little midaz and fentanyl on top of that. Uh, in the ED, I like to use fentanyl, and then on top of that, maybe a little propofol or something else, but it dramatically decreases your sedative use. You get you know, good analgesia first. And how are you dosing your ketamine infusion? That's anywhere between one and three milligrams per kilogram per hour. 
Um, you know, your induction dose is typically two. And so 500 milligram vial on your average patient, that, that'll get me home. That's pretty much our, our practice as well in, in West Cork and in Quicker. We'll, we'll keep the same standards. So. Uh, Viking, you had a rant as well. Yeah, it was a privilege um, getting a chance to do a bit ranting, and it was a privilege to getting kicked in my balls by Jason before we started and changing it all. That was uh, great. And I think it's important to stand up for your patient. And looking around the table and everybody's nodding, and what we've been talking about for the last 40 minutes is actually standing up for a patient, whether it's uh, by training or treating the little ones as we should treat the adult ones and stuff. And I think it's so important. And Sometimes people just need to kick in the balls and someone's saying, for fuck's sake, stand up for your patient. And I think we can all agree, but we just need to be reminded occasionally. And we can do that at home as well. Yep, I have more regrets for what I didn't do for my patients than what I did, you know, wrong. Mm. So. Absolutely. And I think uh, those are good words to end the podcast on in true uh, Dr. Hines' fashion and tradition. Do everything possible for your patient and be the number one advocate for your patient, especially if they're critically ill. And with that, thank you so much for joining us and uh, sharing with the pre-hospital world uh, all about SMAC Force. Um, Ashley, can you give us a small prelude to SMAC Force 2017? Nope. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Lots of suspense. <laughs> Lots of suspense. And thank you so much for joining and listening in. This is Faison Arshad wishing everyone a safe tour.